Hello and welcome to episode two of Wonderback's four-part series, our American Single Malt 101 Whiskey Education. We are delighted to have everybody here. Cheers to everybody watching and to you guys. Um, while I'm kind of giving you the preamble, if you would uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, that would be great. Um, Wonderback is a boutique distillery located in Hood River, Oregon. Um, we like to do things a little bit differently. Um, so what we do is explore the world of American single malts by uh, distilling our own bespoke grain bill with partner um, distilleries around the country. So we collaborate with them, we make our grain bill, and then we bring that whiskey home to Hood River to our barn uh, to age, finish, and bottle. Um, so this week we are talking about malted barley. Um, obviously it is the primary ingredient into the good stuff. And over the next 30 to 40 minutes, we hope to talk to you a little bit about how barley is malted, the differences between a pale malt and a specialty malt. And spoiler alert, we at Wonderback love specialty malts. And then also get into our particular grain bill for the Evergreen Collection and talk a little bit about growing barley at the farm in Hood River. Um, so that's what we're gonna cover today. Um, next up, let me introduce to you our speakers. Of course, we have Phil Downer. He's the uh, founder of Wonderback and my lovely husband. And then we also have Blake and Marcus joining us from the That's Neat podcast. Um, they do a wonderful podcast on whiskey, the stories around whiskey and the people who make it. And you can find them on That's Neat podcast.com or on Instagram at That's Neat underscore podcast. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to the guys. Enjoy yourself. We hope you have a glass. Um, and we hope you enjoy this episode of Wonderback's uh, 101 Whiskey Education Series. Thank you. Over to you guys. Thanks, Sash. Uh, we're going to, first of all, we're going to talk about malted grain and and kind of what it is and how it impacts whiskey. So malted grain, what what is it? Well, it plays a huge role in the whiskey we all drink from scotch, the Japanese whiskey to even American whiskey, uh, like bourbons and rye. It's often an ingredient in, in their mash bill. Um, and most recently, uh, American single malt, which we'll be talking a lot about today. Um, so what what is it? How is it made? So technically, it's any grain that has been germinated and dried, but most commonly, it's a barley that is malted for, for whiskey production. Uh, there's a three-step process in making this whiskey. Uh, the first step is to steep the grain, which sounds exactly uh, like what it is, you take that grain and you soak it in water to activate it and start the germination process. Um, and the goal here is to bring the hydration content of that grain to upwards of 45 to 50% even. And then from there, you go into the second step, which is the germination. Mm -hmm. So you achieve this um, by spreading that grain out over the malt floor or the, a concrete floor and turning it, whether traditionally by um, by hand or uh, in by an, an industrial way with a, a machine drum. Um, and this creates an even airflow. And then in about four to five days time, the grain actually starts to grow from that moisture. Uh, so you get tiny little rootlets and sprouts coming out of the grain. And then at this point, the grain is ready for the third step. And that third step is kilning or drying. And, and in this step, the grain, um, you, you, do, you do this step to, to prevent the grain from further germination or to stop it from growing in a sense. So the grain is entered into the kiln and dried to as low as 3% hydration. So it's coming from 45 to 50% all the way down to 3% now. And in this process is what impacts the flavor the most of that grain. So depending on the time and the type of heat that's used for the grain, uh, the flavors can range anywhere from deep roasted toffee to light tropical fruits like bananas and pineapples to even rich, oily, smoky campfire type flavors. And, it, and again, it all depends on the type of heat source that is used. And then from there, the grain is dried, it's crushed, and then turned into back into water. It, it, 
it's put back into water uh, again and steeped. So it's turned into then the wort or a beer more like, and then you separate the grain that is used in the, in the water um, to uh, continue the fermentation. And then if you were making beer at this time, you would be done. You would have a beer more or less. You would have a beer you could drink. Um, but if you're making whiskey, you then take that fermented uh, liquid, that wort, and then you distill it. But I wanted to bring up the kind of like circle back to the, the malting process um, versus the traditional method um, versus the industrial malting method where one is turned by hand and one is turned by the machine drum. And I was just wanting to kind of turn it to, to you guys and see if you think if there's really a, a, a difference when when it's turned by hand or if uh, it really does impact the the flavor profile or the grain itself. So what, what do you guys think? Market. I can't hear Marcus. Marcus, you're muted. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I can, I, you know, so I, I don't have any experience with, uh, personally with the floor malting versus the, the industrial malting, uh, per se. Um, I can imagine that, um, with the floor malting, there's a, um, a significant amount of variation batch to batch. And even within each batch, there will be variation in the degree of, of heating and then <clears throat> the time from, um, uh, uh, the time from the uh, germination to the, um, to the drying. Um, and so I think that variation can be a good thing. We talked about it earlier, um, if you would like that. And, and whereas the industrial large drum, large batch size uh, malting process would create a very uniform product, a malt that um, would be consistent batch to batch and uh, within each batch as well, there would be very little uh, variation, um, which also can be a good thing and, and uh, in terms of its predictability. Um, and, you know, just to clarify, <clears throat> this is the pale malt typically. So the, this would be the pale malt, the base malt. This is the malt that um, uh, this is the malt that you would use for the the source of your sugars and your enzymes and your taste some of your tastes um, different than the specialty malts which we'll talk about later yeah and um, do you think there's a the malt industry in the Pacific Northwest do you how would you say that differs from maybe the traditional methods that are used in say uh scotland or ireland marcus are you there are you able to uh oh we can't hear you still oh man that's a let's keep working on that technical issue um so i've seen i the place that i've seen the both the traditional and the um uh let's say traditional floor malting and then the industrial is in scotland um and um you know, I, 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 I would say that uh, places that use floor malting and have used floor malting as a source of their pale malt or even their specialty malts, if they have, a, um, if they have the ability to use a drum roaster, um, they would like that. I mean, it, ha it gives you much more control over, over your end product. You can, you can adjust the um, many, many, many variables, the water itself, the temperature of the water, the time on the floor, the, 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 the aggressiveness of turning or not, the, um, the drying method that you use, uh, you know, all of it can be uh, tinkered with. These are variables that we can't adjust if you order your malt from an industrial malting house. Um, but then you look at an, an industrial malting house and it's, it's incredibly impressive how large they are. The amount of grain that they're putting through these malt, like Simpson's malt house that I visited in Scotland is a massive facility. You have large, you know, 18 wheeler trucks coming in and out with grain all the time. 
and um, it's super impressive. Especially, well, both the big drums, they're they're more they're vertical drums typically for the germination, the, the soaking of the grain and the germination, and then the more the 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 kiln that's used to dry the malt. Um, are massive, very larger, much larger diameter than the drums used to to steep the grain, and mm -hmm. you know, with hot air blowing up through it, and these big wands coming across these beds of of of, uh, of grain, um, it's super impressive. The amount of energy that goes into these things is crazy. Like you look at the you look at the the power sources coming into these things, and it's uh, it's incredible. I, I I don't know how many watts of energy that these things are using per day, but it's it's massive. It's a big big operation. So, I would imagine you'd want to put these large industrial malt houses in a place where in energy is relatively cheap. Um, so yeah, I I, I think it uh, there are pros and cons to each of them. You know. Yeah, that's I like that you brought up the malt houses you visited. I've actually never visited a, a malt house before. It sounds really fascinating. Has there been any other ones you've visited? Have you visited? I have. I have the it, U.S. No, or? There's a massive facility in Washington, in Vancouver, Washington, Great Western, <clears throat> where we get our malt, and I've never visited. Uh, I've seen pictures online of the facility, but I, I've never visited in person. Um. But yeah, I mean that's a perfect place for a malt house. You 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 have access to the the growers, and then you have access to cheap energy. So it's it's kind of perfect. Um, but yeah, we have we have we have a special we have an industrial malt house in our backyard, Vancouver, Washington, and uh, and so um, yeah, it's it's quite it's quite special. And and you know I don't know if we're going to touch on it as much today, but growing barley is also a very interesting thing to talk about. You know, we grow barley at the farm. The Northwest is a great place to grow barley, turns out. And Skagit mm -hmm. Valley is a really special place for that. There's a, there's a, I guess what I would call a mid-size malting facility in Skagit Valley. Um, and there are other ones that main stem and so on that we've worked with uh, around the region. Um, and it's really nice to be able to work with these um, these specialty malt houses that have the ability to to change the the, the various variables. You know the, the the types of grain that we're using. We, we like I said, we grow grain at the farm and want at uh, where the distillery is. Um, we can choose whatever grain we want as long as it grows well in our climate. And um, that's the same with these smaller malt houses, where uh, where you can you can change grain, you can change, you know, the various variables that we've talked about: water, water temperature, time, and the steeping times, the, mm -hmm. the various things that you can change, and have an output that's quite unique and and nice and and special for our region, you know. And that's that's exciting. Um, yeah. I love the fact that we're talking about malt today you know malt is yeah every, every beer lover knows malt and most whiskey no lovers know grain but mm -hmm. um malted barley is a very special grain it's it's not like corn or or wheat uh when you when you add the, the energy that we're talking about that's used to malt these this grain barley it 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 creates some amazingly unique uh, amazing flavors that are are uh, are quite nice and um, uh, again I don't know if we're going to talk about this during this podcast but these Maillard reactions that you are or that are creating are um, are quite you know they're very old uh, methods of creating tastes that are that are that are um, are quite delicious and and so having that ability to change these tastes with malted barley is one of the reasons that I wanted to do to make a whiskey with malted barley in the first place yeah yeah that's really good and that's probably a good segue into um, the differences between different uh, types of specialty malts and the base malt and pale malt and with that, I'll hand it over to Marcus, where he's going to talk about that for a little bit. Which hopefully you guys can hear me now. Oh my God, he's here! Oh, he's alive! He has a voice. It's really <laughs> good. It's great. I'm alive. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Finally, the difficulties are over, so we can get back to the good thing. 
which is whiskey and the malts that go into it. So getting into the base versus the specialty malts, um, the base malt is, I mean, it really is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's the, it is the type of malt that is going to make up the majority of what you're putting into, whether it's your beer or your whiskey, right? Whatever it is that you're, you're making, base malt's going to be your main thing. Um, generally, it's a two-row malt um, as opposed to a six-row malt. Um, kind of didn't really get into that, but major difference is the amount of grain that comes off those two, right? The two-row versus the six-row. Six-row just has a lot more grain that comes off of each head of barley. Um, two rows is the sort of main one that gets used a lot, especially for bases. Um, pales and sort of um, Pilsner, Vienna, Munich kind of get used for bases um, a lot, but really that two-row pale malt um, is what gets used as a base. And it's generally um, a little bit mellow, a little bit sweeter than what you're going to get out of um, any sort of specialty malt. Specialty malts have uh, a lot more flavor to them. That's that's kind of the that's kind of where your your interesting and cool flavors are going to come from. Um, the base malt's also really what gives uh, you all of your sugar that is going to be used for the, the actual fermentation. That's what you want in there to, to create the actual alcohol in your alcoholic beverage, right? You need the base malt for that because um, of all of the, um, the fermentable sugars that come out of this malting process. Um, we kind of touched on a little bit earlier that idea of um, the whole reason you're germinating the grain in the first place, right? is to release some of those enzymes to break down the starches in the grain that make that yeah. sugar um, a little bit more available. And in base malts, that two-row malt has a lot more of that sugar um, available to it than uh, a six-row that you might find in some of the more specialty malts. Um, let me see here. A lot of times, um, the specialty malts, like I said, are used for um, sort of flavoring and for coloring, essentially. Um, you don't actually have to mash specialty malts. Um, you just need to steep them. Um, you certainly can mash them, but you're going to get all of the, the flavor and all of the sort of goodness that you want out of them um, just by adding hot water. They are that good. <laughs> um, which leads a little bit into sort of what, sorry, moved my notes here. <laughs> leads a little bit into the um, sort of difference in flavor profiles that you're going to get out of the difference of the specialty malts. And um, Wanderback uses a couple different specialty malts, right, in their mash bill. Um, Phil, would you like to talk about some of the, the specialty malts that you guys like and like to use in, in your stuff? Yeah. Yeah, so um, just to give the listeners a brief overview, when you when you steep when you steep this raw grain, you basically soak it in water. What what basically happens is it starts to think it's going to grow into another barley plant, and so you get um, you get a breakdown, you get a release of enzymes, you start or production of enzymes. And you start to grow a, uh, I think what it's called is a chit. It's basically a rootlet. And, um, and then what happens is you can either take that, that uh, grain, which has a chit growing out of it, a small little green shoot. And you can either take that and dry it in a large kiln to bring the moisture content from about, I think it was 40, 45% let's say half, let's say 50%, down to 4 to 5%. And that's what you would use as a pale malt. If you, though, if you take that what's called green malt and you don't dry it, you don't put it in a kiln, but instead you put it in a drum, a, a drum which has a heat source and it turns, so it, it aerates and it, uh, it, 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 it enables oxygen to be present uh, and carbon dioxide to, to be used in the in the in the in the process of heating you then have the ability to create some of the specialty malts um, such as crystal 
and caramel. These malts are typically made by taking that what's called green malt. So it's 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 malt that is beginning to grow a sprout, but has not been it has not been dried. And you put that in a drum, and typically you'll heat that, and you will keep the moisture content high in that drum. You'll release some of the as you heat it. If there's a lot of moisture, the pressure will go up because it, 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 the water becomes steam. And um, it, I can't remember the exact temperature, but I think we're talking about 120, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But um, the, 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 so there's, a, there's, there's pressure that's let off, but basically you're cooking this grain in a very warm, moist environment. And, and that's a place where you create, um, like I said, the caramels and the crystals. But if you take that grain and you dry it in a kiln, so you bring the, the moisture content way down to like four or five percent, and then you put it in that same drum and you apply heat, that's when you get the very um, dry, acrid, almost burnt uh, uh, malts, which would be the pale chocolate malt. So we, we, I, you know, so basically I like, I like beer as most people who like whiskey do. And, and I, I like hoppy beer and I like non hoppy beer. I like brown ales. I like stouts. I like them all. Um, and, uh, so what I wanted to do was find specialty malts that I liked and, uh, their crystal that we use, uh, 60 Lova bond. I liked. It's a very easy one to like. It has a bunch of toffee. It's a very, it's a, it's a very easy one. Um, and Munich was a very unique, super malty specialty malt. Um, I believe Stranahan's uses Munich, and Stranahan's was one of the first whiskeys that I liked that I that I got some inspiration from. And then I like the brown ales and the stouts, and though that's the pale chocolate malt. You know, that's a very unique malt. And I was I wasn't so worried about what crystal was going to do. I knew it was going to add sweetness, toffee, yummy, easy type tastes. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit concerned with the Munich, not so much concerned, but I didn't want to duplicate things. Munich is a very bready, malty uh, taste. And as I as I may have, as some of the listeners may know, the ba I mean it's super basic how I sort of came to realize what the taste of these things were. I was, I was making beer, which is, you know, something that some of us do. <laughs> but also taking these grains and grinding them in a coffee grinder and just putting them in hot water, steeping them. And you can smell it right away. It's super easy. And you can even have a sip of that tea. And it's, it's pretty clear what taste you're dealing with there. And I was also quite concerned with the effect of pale chocolate malt. Pale chocolate malt is a very, very unique malt it's it's almost black there are there are uh spicy smoky burnt acrid type tastes and uh in my mind i was thinking that all of these tastes that we're getting pay it from the pale malt then the specialty malts all of them were going to be amplified when you distill this um you you just you concentrate flavors and so that's the reason for the low concentration of pale chocolate and Munich malt. It was just basically not to overpower the other things. We're I mean, with all these things, we're trying to layer flavors, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I came at the, 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 the grain bill uh, in that way, just basically trying to layer. the. We want to get the, the sweets, the, 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 the more spice, the acrid, the... The, the, we're trying to do that just the same as we do with uh, with cooking and 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 food and and coffee and and these other things, you know. So, um, what's re yeah? Does that does that answer your question? I, I don't want to go on for too long. I'm sure I'm going to get a stop talking sign from my wife. Yeah, it gives us a great idea of you know the different flavors that you can get out of these different specialty malts and even the base malt, right? The different you know sort of. Yeah. Flavors out of them, and the the whole reason why you would want to um, uh, malt these slightly differently, right? Because you wind up with uh, drastically different flavors out yeah. of something like you know, like you said, that is um, you know, sort of done in the the sort of traditional way of base malt, as opposed to um, you know, dried and toasted a little bit more like that pale chocolate or some of these other yeah. things. You have such drastically different flavors, and it really creates a a very nice um variation in ingredients that you can put into 
your yeah. your whiskey. One of the thing I, I we we Blake and I talked about it I, uh, earlier when you were uh, when dealing with technical dish issues that we all deal with. But um, one of the big distinctions between pale and specialty malts is uh, in, the, in with the pale malt process, you're basically um, you're basically allowing this grain to um, grow or start to grow and. Uh, and then you're stopping that process uh, at a certain point. And so you're not doing a whole lot to alter the flavor. Whereas when you create a specialty malt, you put these malts in a, in a heated drum, basically, that rotates and aerates the thing. And it has a varying degree of humidity in that environment. But the big thing that you're introducing is these Maillard reactions. Uh, I think it's spelled M-A-L-L-I-A-R-D, I think is the, is the mm -hmm. whole thing. Maillard reactions are, or Maillard, what is it called? There's a, there's another word that goes with it. But basically, I just remember Maillard. Maillard, Maillard reactions are the browning reactions that we use for many, many things. So the reason why a steak tastes so good, the reason why it's not so good to take a steak and cook it sous vide and eat it sous vide at the perfect temperature versus taking a steak and let's say cooking it sous vide at whatever temperature you like and then searing it, really hitting it hard with some high heat is the Maillard reactions. Maillard are the browning reactions. And, and, and so when you, stick, when you stick grain, whether it's green or not, in a roasting drum and you add energy and you, you, you rotate it so there's oxygen, you're creating, you're allowing Maillard reactions to enter the whole deal. And, and, and Maillard reactions are a vast range of flavors that are, are typically quite wonderful. I mean, you, you can get to the high end of the, of the browning reactions with the, like the pale chocolate malts, and these are the more acrid, acidic type reactions um, that aren't for everybody um, versus the lower energy things like you would... I think you would see I, again. I'm not. I'm not so familiar with the uh, with the process here, but I think with the crystal, particularly with the lower Lova bond crystal malts, these are the Maillard reactions are not so drastic. There's not as much energy added, and so those are easy ones. Those are sweeter. You still have some of the sugars there. They're not so burnt. These sugars and and those are those are very approachable sweet type. Uh, uh, of flavors um and so yeah that's that's it again i'm, I'm probably rambling on but i, I oh no <laughs> Do you, i i had a question um come up uh, is is the type of malt that's used the type of barley um mm. is it is it still the two row barley that is used um to make that the specialty malt or is it is it a different type of barley and and all together uh, Marcus, I don't know if you know this. I, I think these are pretty much two row. Uh, the six row barley is a very high enzyme content barley. So when you will need a big bang of enzymes, uh, taste is not well. I shouldn't say this because I'm 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 not in the industry. But I, I my my impression is that when you use six row, you're looking for a big bang of enzymes used to break down the sugars to more uh, usable for the yeast and uh, sugars. Whereas, or as a catalyst, if you've got other things in there, if you're yeah. brewing beer that has, you know, um, uh, rice in it, for instance, right, yes. or has a little bit of corn in it, um, that doesn't quite have as much of the enzymes that you yeah. need in there to convert those sugars. And so they'll throw six malt in there because it's got even even more than regular two row. Yeah. Right, so a lower con lower volume of those six row would create would allow would pr provide more of the enzymes than the same volume of two row. Yes. Yeah. Oh wow. But I I think most of the specialty malts are made with two row. That's the predominant grain that's grown. So I would imagine that's predominantly used for the specialties. So kind of circling back to uh, like the beer discussion, does your beer and whiskey kind of preferences align fill a little bit do you think or like you well well i don't know i mean i look i love a brown ale i love a, i love a good stout but i really love a good northwest ipa we make some wonderful yeah. ipas and 
I mean, the deal with the IPA, as with whiskey, is a good IPA is that you've got a real balance between a um, more acidic, sharp hops flavor, uh, a, a balancing with the sweet maltiness of the malt of the malt that you're using, and and those would typically be lighter malts. Typically, a uh, you know an IPA would not be a dark colored beer. Uh, and I love a nice West Coast balanced IPA. I don't like the massive hop, you know, smack in the face. Um, and I also, you know, so I have preferences, whatever. But yeah, I mean, totally. I, I you know, when I, when I lived in Canada, twenty plus years ago, um, we had the best beer. We had, but it was Molson Canadian, and it was, uh, it was. Uh, yeah, it was it was nothing that special, but it was Molson Canadian. It was way better than what the U.S. had. And then I moved to the U.S., and it was at that time, 20 years ago, when the North, particularly the Northwest, the West Coast, was making some tremendous beers, like some really, really, you know, amazing beers. And that that then made me really no, take notice and be like, wow, you can you can do some interesting things here and and uh, make some really really nice uh, flavors and I think you. I think you could say that that was the beginning of maybe Wanderback. Was that that love for good beer that we now have? I mean, we have such an amazing uh, b breadth of beer flavors in the U.S. It's uh, it's a, it's good. It's really really good. And and uh, you know my my the way I look at it is malt whiskey, American single malt. It's like all that good stuff without the hops distilled, mm -hmm. concentrated, and put at a higher alcohol. It's 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 like it's amazing. It's like a beer, it's like a beer distilled to the goodness of all that good stuff. And and so it's you know beer. But, it's beer perfected. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's beer it's beer but better. <laughs> it's beer but better, you know? And so uh yeah I, you know the thing is, it's a tricky thing. You don't want to overpower people with the bready maltiness, and you don't want to you don't want to overpower them with the smoky, acidic, uh, pale maybe the pale chocolate malt influence. And 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 uh, and then you know we have we I don't know if we talked about barrels or we're going to talk about barrels, but you know then you enter that whole thing and the barrels that yeah. are used. That's that's quite special, and then and, I uh, think that's, that's in uh, two weeks we talk about barrels. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, because that that's you know that's. That's part of the other part of the equation. We don't, we don't, we're not talking about yeast or water, which are clearly, I mean, yeast is, I would say probably number one factor, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, it's, it's, uh, it's super fun. It's, it's fun. To, it's fun to think about these flavor flavors and these, these, uh, these layers of flavors and uh, malt is a very special grain. It's um, and it's fun to grow as well. Maybe you could talk a little bit about like was just circle back to the to the evergreen bill to the the mash bill that you use for the evergreen series, and maybe you could just talk a little bit about that and maybe the future of the mash bills and distillery partners that you're going to be using. Yeah, if, well, I think I touched on how I got to the specialty malt part of it. Um, the the base malt the pale malt uh you know i wanted to use northwest malt and and we were working with westland initially and and uh, that's what we had and it was good malt and i was like yeah perfect <clears throat> but we have looked at other base malts too um i made a beer one time with golden promise and then i then i read about um the early days i don't know if i'm allowed to say this but balcones was using it in their uh, malt whiskey single malt, which I loved the early days. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so then we were going to, we looked at golden promise as a, as a base malt as well. That's a very, that's a very special pale malt. That's only, you know, produced and sold in the UK, but we can get it here. Um, and so we're open to other base pale malts and, um, but I think we're going to plant our flag for our specialty malts. I like what they do to our whiskey, and, and I hope people like it too. Um, and uh, I think I like that's it. one of the main – sorry? I just said I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
But, you know, the, the availability and the use of these specialty malts is something that I think differentiates the American single malts from the single malts produced elsewhere in the world. I mean, in, in, in other parts of the world, they are using specialty malts, but I, I, I believe, I don't, I don't have knowledge of all this, but I think they're used in very small quantities in the grain bill. You know, we're, we're, we're looking at 12% uh, specialty malts in our grain bill. That's a lot, especially when you, when you appreciate the flavors that this, these various specialty malts bring to the table, you know, and, and uh, so that's quite fun. I think that's something the Americans can be quite proud of and it makes our product unique. Um, and there's the barrel effect too, that is different in what we do there. And, and then we can talk about that later, but um, so, yeah. And, and, and in terms of distillery partners, you know, I love, I love meeting these people. They're super fun interesting these guys that are making good stuff guys and gals are making really good whiskey and uh the ones that we really like are the ones doing the american single malts they're using pot stills and they're they're showing an appreciation for uh well for the malts and then the other things too yeast water stills everything um and so yeah it's it's a bit of a unique uh, business model going out to these distilleries and asking them if they'll if they'll make our whiskey with our grain bill and most of them say no but some of them say yes and that's really nice and it's it's super fun to collaborate with these folks and and help them along and uh and they certainly help us and i and i hope we can keep doing it that way i mean um yeah it's it's worked out well so far and, and we'll see how far we can take it <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely unique. I don't know of anyone else really doing the same thing. It's yeah, it's really it's really cool. I really I think it's really Good. cool and unique. Um, That's I was I was gonna ask, kind of uh, coming back to the barley and maybe like the local barley that you guys grow there at the farm. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how you're gonna be using that in your in your whiskey or if you are using it. Yeah, so we worked with Oregon State University. Um, oh shoot, his name escapes me now. Who I work with, but you know, I had never grown barley before. We 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 have a farm there with forty acres, and we'd grown cherries and apples, which we still do, just in large in, in lo much less quantities than we used to. And um, uh, we we wondered if we could make if we could grow barley, and it turns out we could. I mean, you can grow barley. I think. I don't know, but I think pretty much anywhere. Barley is an extremely resilient grain. And um, yeah, we just started to do the research, talk to various people and realize that we could, uh, that we could make it. And so we started to, um, we started to talk to people about tilling the field and, and irrigation and tilling. And then, and then also we had to figure out how to cut it when it was grown, which, requires a combine which is a fairly mm -hmm. formidable piece of equipment yeah. and uh, <laughs> I initially bought the first combine online as people mostly do from some guy in eastern Washington and it was a, it was a complete piece of junk I mean it, it, it probably would have killed me if I tried to use it to actually harvest green <laughs> so, uh, thankfully somebody else found that valuable I mean it looked nice but it wouldn't have been very functional and oh yeah, Pat Hayes. Thank you, Maggie. Pat Hayes is who Dr. Pat Hayes is who I work with, and he's a wonderful guy. And he, him and his group uh, at Oregon State have worked on barley for probably more than a, I'm sure more than a decade. And full pint is one of the grains that they developed at Oregon State, and that works very or grows very well in the Northwest. And I made a beer with it, and it tasted good. And so we grew it, and we grew it for a couple of years to see if we could, and 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 we could. And then we grew it and harvested it and uh, work with a local uh, brewery in, in, uh, in um, um, uh, Hood River, Double Mountain, and uh, um, uh, work with the, the local distillery, uh, McCarthy's, uh, and uh, may, they distilled it for us. Um, and uh, it's in barrels right now. And, and I think it's coming along well. It's early days, and, and I, you know, but it's certainly – the uh, um, uh, new make spirit was was very nice, uh, and and uh, so I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, but time will tell. And and uh, we're looking to continue to grow grain. I don't know if we'll stick with full pint. I think it's going to be fun for us. So one of the things, obviously, I should mention is that we use this grain unmalted. So 
Uh, this is unmalted grain, which is not very commonly used, uh, certainly not in North America. It, it, it is used in Irish uh, whiskey more commonly. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going to see what types of notes we get from that. Um, and uh, but that's been a really fun thing. It's just, it's a, it's a portion of your grain bill, yeah. or as a portion. We treated it like the specialty malt. So we have our base malt as our main mm -hmm. flavor, sugar, enzyme source. But then we use the, the uh, full pint. We use the full pint unmalted, and our mm -hmm. specialty malts as well. And so that's going to be really interesting to see how mm -hmm. that comes along. And uh, so I'm cautiously optimistic, but time will tell. And uh, yeah. we'll see. That's that's really awesome. That's that's kind of taking local to like a whole new level. I, so. I hope I hope it's good whiskey. <laughs> it certainly seems to be good from initial <laughs> from initial nosing, but uh, time yeah. will tell. Um, but yeah, I agree. I, I think that is about as local as you can get. I mean, you know, we're taking grain grown on our farm and using it for our whiskey. And it's been wonderful as well to work with the guys in Hood River and gals in Hood River mm -hmm. uh, to, to, you know, collaborate with them and, uh, and uh, really wonderful people. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, my hope is that we can create a real hub there in Hood River. Of, we already have a great hub of beer and wine and, and, uh, and spirits. Um, I just want to, it's not, it's fun to be a part of that and grow that, you know, develop it further. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I should say this, but I, when I was at the bar at the farm or at the farm, the, at the barn, um, I did get the smell a barrel of the McCarthy's that was aging there. And I got to say that was some of the most promising like new make that I've ever smelled in my I know it's it's cr I'm glad to hear you say that me too it's, I am so excited could you do you know about how many years it will be until it's ready well you know it's interesting no I I don't know I I think if it's like what we've made uh in the past um I think at 3 years we're going to see a um it's going to be you know, hopefully getting close to maturity and then we'll decide, you know, how we, if we, uh, we, we typically will do a small finish in a, a previously used cask, a more neutral cask. And then sometimes mm -hmm. we'll do a finishing cask, you know, but so I would say three and a half, four years, if I had to guess, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're looking, we're releasing whiskeys of varying ages and I'm sort of looking at what people like and, what they what they what they really like and not so much and that's sort of helping us determine you know are we going to release big fat whiskeys at three and a half three to four years or are we going to do a more uh, prolonged maturation uh, I, I would imagine we'll do probably the full range um but uh yeah so you know time will tell but uh it's super fun to see that one mature. It's fun to see them all mature, but that one is a special one because that that's a yeah. uh, that's a hyper local uh, collaboration that um, I'm really hoping we can we can grow uh, we can grow. You know, yeah, that's going to be awesome. That's going to be really great. Yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be fun. Yeah, and that that grain bill is special. That's that's a proper unmalted grain in there. And so, yeah, seeing the taste differences, the taste notes that are unique compared to the other whiskeys we've done will be will be uh, really, really, really smart. Um, okay, so, I think we're getting we're getting close to ready to welcome Sasha back on here. Um, one quick question, though, uh, looking towards the future. Before we do that, um, your uh, you know you've you've obviously put a lot of. Um, work into the grain bill that went into the evergreen um, series. The upcoming series, um, are those going to be a similar grain bill? Did you play around with the specialties at all? See if you can get slightly different flavors. Do you have any plans for maybe like a, um, you know, one that's, you know, oh, we did like 15% chocolate because we were really trying to, you know, amp yeah. up. Any plans like that for the future or, or yeah. uh, try and perfect that grain bill? Well, I don't, I mean, I'm, we're open to, we're open to anything. Um, ultimately we're trying to make whiskey that people like, I, I, you know what, I, I think what we, what we're, our current, uh, thought is 
that the specialty malts will remain a fairly a constant um, portion of our grain bill in, in probably in that um, uh, proportion. Um, and then we may change the pale malt depending on where we're, where we're distilling and, and so on. But I think the specialty malts will remain a, a fairly constant thing. I, I, I like that. I like I, it makes us unique. I think in, in terms of the taste profile, there are some portions of the taste profile that I think are attributable to that to that specialty malt propor mm -hmm. uh, proportions and, and uh, content. So uh, definitely, I, I, yeah. you know, you know, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I, I, I just I think that that specialty malt mix is something that we can fairly easily keep constant regardless of where we where we where we distill and um i i think it's something that makes us unique and it's 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 a special i think it's a special thing yeah it definitely is i remember first time yeah. having um batch one and and sean and i being just dumbfounded by right. realizing it's not peated like it yes. it tastes like the amount of chocolate melt that you must be using in there or, or the, the, the quality of it. Yeah. Yeah. The, it, 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 it adds such a, a smoky chocolatey character Yes, that it, you kind of attribute to like an earthy peatiness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's amazing. And it's something we just, right. I'm, I'm almost out of batch one. Luckily I know a place that has a couple bottles left, but I know, wow. you know, it's so, it's so funny. I don't, I don't want to go to, I know Sash is probably going to be putting up the uh, quit it sign very quickly. Yeah. But you know, it's so funny. You bet, it, it's amazing when you make whiskey, the emotional uh, connection you get with these whiskeys. I remember when I made that batch one, this is before Sash was involved and it was, it was pretty much me. And I was just like, God, people are not going to like this. This is, this is crazy. And then, and and initially the, it was it was a you know you you get some people who love batch one like crazy and other people it's just not for them because of the oh, there is a bit of smoke it's not a heavy smokiness but that is a nice whiskey now and as I look back and and as we've released more I I've appreciated batch one more um, and so yeah I, it's it's really fun to do these things and and. Uh, and, and see also that each batch take on a, a sort of a life of its own. Some of them are more approachable than others. Um, but I really like batch one too. And I, I, I think that that is a, a big whiskey that um, uh, of a type of whiskey that I want to keep making for, for people because it's a, uh, it's a good one. And it's uh, it's, it's so, yeah, we'll see. I mean, the pressure's on, but uh, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I gotta say, each batch following has lived up. So it's so good. Es especially batch four is like, yeah. it's batch right. one with a, like I said, it's batch one it's, with a fitted tux. It's, it's, it's yeah, that it's yeah. amazing. That the ex bourbon cask, it's amazing. Oh, there's there's that sign. Okay, sorry. I'll, uh, I'll <laughs> we started talking about whiskey, story. Sasha. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, it's great. It's it's we're really looking forward to to everything coming up. Um, the the collaboration you guys have with McCarthy's and your local barley is it's probably my most anticipated whiskey. So Good. I'm just yeah. I am genuinely keeping a close eye. <laughs> Good. As really close happy. as I can. I'm glad I'm in contact with you guys so I can Yeah, it's great to keep as close as I as I can. So that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. That is great. Well, you guys, um, we didn't have much chitter chatter at the beginning, but um, I'm actually really glad because that was super informative. I've learned a ton listening to you. So thank you all for that. Um, I think we're going to um, maybe pick up the uh, the byline of it. It's, it's beer, but better. <laughs> oh, God, don't say that. The beer makers are going to be pissed off. Uh, let them. <laughs> Let them. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think this has been a wonderful episode. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Phil. Um, we will be back again in two weeks' time. Um, and the next topic is when we take the mash bill to the distillate. So we'll be talking about the distillery process, the different distilleries, the different stills that we use, 
and hopefully having a really fun and informative conversation about that. So thank you again. Um, have a great Whiskey Wednesday, and we'll see you next time. See you. Thanks, you guys. guys. Really nice talking to you. Thanks, Sash. Thank you. Bye-bye.